We draw our attention to you. We uh, exalt your name, and we worship you here right now together, Father. Where two or more are gathered, there also you will be. Lord, we worship you, and we lift up your name in praise. Come on. Take us away, Ray. Morning, everybody. Don't be a stranger. Come closer if you want to.
to be reminded folks yeah we do is that not true I do I need to be reminded yeah because you're stirring up those deep deep wells inside of you and me right come on God I'm going to play you this song I learned during the week and uh, it's got one word in it and it's called hallelujah so if you need the words in the screen there it is right there right so, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let out a bit of fun.
promise to never leave us or forsake us. No matter how bad it looks. <laughs> wow. Yeah, our Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to come together. And we worship you, Father. We come here this morning not leaning on our own understanding, Lord, but in all our ways we acknowledge you and we trust in you. Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. And I give it all to you, God. Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I'll give it all. And I give it all to you, God. Trust. Thank you. 
you. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the one. You are the one that cleanses us from our sin. You are the one. You are our God. You are the one that heals. You are the one that saves. There is nothing that any of us can do to, to add to that or to, to um, replace that. So we don't need to look to another. We don't need to look for things. We don't need to look and put our trust in anything other than you and your all-sufficient sacrifice. Mm. There is nothing else that can make us whole, that can make us look good, smell good, that can make us dazzle and razzle with the blood of Jesus is all we need. Mm. Lord, let us be a, a people, a children that would put our trust and our hope in you. Let us be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. Ah. Ah. I just want to invite everybody to take communion, to take the emblems and bring it back to your seat, um, just to the left and the right. Thanks, Dan. a sweet environment to just come and, and be, just lower any defences, lower any distractions and just be in the presence of our Saviour. Mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. Just envelop every person here, Lord. Mm, yeah. The goodness of our God. Just focus on the goodness of our God. know guys when I was growing up my mother taught me about Jesus she read Christ, uh, she read um, Bible stories to us as children at bedtime and I knew that um, God that God gave his son his only son as a sacrifice for my sins and I grew up knowing that and um, there's uh, and, and as I was a child I'm talking also to, to the children in the room. When I was a child and um, I knew that I needed to be obedient to my parents and I used to tell myself, well, you know, Jesus was obedient even to death on the cross. Like that wasn't a fun chore. <laughs> so when my mother would ask me to do my chores and I didn't want to have to, I would tell myself, well, that's all right for Jesus. Like, he was holy. Of course he was obedient and all things. He was holy. But here's the thing, right? And I wish I had had this understanding when I was a child. But, yes, um, Jesus was obedient to his heavenly Father because he knew who he was and he understood the purpose and he was obedient just because it was right it was right to be obedient and as I grew up I began to learn that it wasn't just about Jesus's obedience it was also about the father's goodness it wasn't just because the father had a whim and said yeah I'll see 
how good you are, do this. No, he actually, because of his goodness, he asked Jesus to die on the cross. He put that before him. And um, so there's so there's the goodness of the Father, there's the obedience of Jesus, but there's this, this other thing that is so important for us to grab a hold of. And um, in Hebrews 12, it says, there's clues of this all throughout the Bible. And children, you, there's no children's church, you're on school holidays. So you're going to get a chance to hear from the front more of a teaching and revelation and an understanding of this piece. So for instance, Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, it says in, in the Bible, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, there's that also, let us also lay aside every weight, every sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what was that joy set before him? This is what I came to understand, and I wish I had known this when I was a child. That joy is the significance of each of you. It's not just do that because Dad said so. It's not just, okay, I mean, as if that, you know, that's enough. And that's, even if it was, that's, that's enough. That's a sufficient sacrifice. But it's also because of the significance of you. So let's not just go, well, you know, okay, that's Jesus. He, he, he did that because, hey, he was holy and, you know, he had, this, had Father's DNA and so do we all. <laughs> but you're significant. You're significant enough for him to be obedient to the task of dying on the cross. And that's just uh, the key to, to just add to it the, the, the whole beautiful sacrifice that Jesus gave because he made it his joy when he thought of you. So with that in mind, we just want to acknowledge him because he saw you and he loves you and he lives in you. And so this, these emblems are a reminder. We are reminding ourselves of what he did, what it means to us, and that we are washed clean because of it. And we, ha we don't need to dance and perform and, you know, but have a pony show to earn our way into our Heavenly Father's favour. It's because we were already significant. And Jesus paid the all-sufficient price. All right. So let's just partake and think on him and his love for you. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for your love. And Jesus, for your all-sufficient sacrifice that we are enough. We are enough in your eyes, each one of us, Lord. And we open our arms and our hearts and receive your love. And we give you ours in this celebration of the price that you paid. Amen. Can we give a, a hand to our worship team, guys? Good job, guys. All right, everybody, why don't we uh, turn around and say hey to the person next to us and just uh, take a second to greet each other.
All right. All right, guys, can we all uh, come back to our seats? High five uh, the person on the way back to your, your chairs. Hopefully your chairs are nice and warm. I feel like our heater is struggling to keep up with the, with the cold. Yeah, let's all just find our seats again. Oh, good morning. How's everybody feeling? We okay? Yeah? Feeling cold? Yeah. I'm feeling brittle because I feel frozen. I might snap or break in a million pieces. Um, so we have uh, some, we just have a few notices this morning. Um, the Jamie Galloway Conference is coming up July 21st to 22nd. If you haven't registered, please do so at Hillview's website. This is not a conference you guys want to miss. Jamie is amazing. It's going to be super fun. I, I really am looking forward to the whole thing. Um, so if you guys haven't registered yet, please go to hillview.org.au slash Jamie Galloway, and you can register there. Also, who knows that we have a team from Hillview in Sri Lanka right now. Yeah, I know. It's super exciting. They landed, and I think they they're straight like went straight away into ministry. So I think they had a pastoral conference or something. Like It's a bit full on. So be praying for them, for them and all their families. I think everybody has kids there. So, um, yeah, it should be a wild, awesome ride. Um, but uh, now it's that time for us to take up our tithes and offering. If I could get my usher. Yeah, ex women is on the 14th of July. July. So that's next, yeah, two weeks. Friday week. Next Sunday. <laughs> Cool. Uh, can we get our, uh, our declarations up? Who likes doing declarations? I've just gotten really into it recently, writing down declarations of things I want to see shift and things I'm believing the Lord for. But I love that we do this, and who knows that our words have power. Yeah? So we're going to pass around those buckets. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Just come, up, or come around and pass the buckets if you guys can do that. Um, you guys can give on push pay. We also have an FPOS machine in the back, and uh, cash is great, too. Um, yes. It's still acceptable. <laughs> in this day and age. All right, once, you've, uh, once the bucket's gone past, if you guys can stand to your feet, and we're going to declare this together. So can we get that first one up? All right. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, Storehouses unlocked and miracles created. Dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, signs and wonders with divine manifestations. Anointing, gifting and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations. Souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you'll pour out favor, blessing, and increase upon me so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Amen as well. All right, you guys may be seated. So today is a fun day. Gary has something fun to share with us. I believe it's the beginning of something. Um, and he'll tell, tell us more about it. But why don't we give Gary a warm, honoring welcome to the, to the front. Bless the Lord. God's good? Awesome. Why don't we stand? I'd love us to stand again if we can. Let's just put our hands out like this in, in, a, in a posture of receiving. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just don't want this just to be a, a time that passes. But, Lord, we want this to be an appointed time. Father, we want this to be a time that's not informational but transformational. Lord, we want this word to, Lord, build a foundation in our lives. Lord, that we can continue to build on day after day after day. Lord, I thank you that the words and your words are not temporary but are eternal. Lord, they're not words that are fleeting, but Lord, they are words that are faithful. Lord, they are words 
Lord, that have stood 2,000 years. And Lord, your word is still number one on the bestsellers list. So Lord, I thank you right now that your word is already proven. Your word is already proven. And so, Lord, we posture our hearts right now to, to receive, Lord, not just the rhema, but the logos. Lord, even as your rhema is spoken, Lord, we ask you to speak to us. Lord, that you would unpack in us and through us more and more of, Lord, what you want to release in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. If you've got your Bibles with me, or you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me. We're going to look today, and we're going to begin, uh, I believe, a series that is not just something that is going to be t- words that tickle our ears. They're not going to be words that um, will be forgotten, but I believe over these next weeks, I believe the word that God wants to lay in our lives is a foundational word that, that we can build on. And so I want to unpack some things from Scripture but the foundation of the launch pad that I'm, I'm launching off today is this umbrella or this foundation of this statement, the greater things. And so as you realize and as you know, there's a transition that's happening within the life of this church. There's a transition and that's happening in the life of, of Sarah and I. There's a transition that is going on. And that transition isn't to be ignored. That transition isn't to be just looked over. That transition is real. And that transition causes a number of things to happen, both positively and negatively. And nothing can be dismissed and nothing can be looked over, but everything that happens within that transition is valid. The way you feel is valid. The way we respond is valid. And this isn't something that God isn't used to, and this isn't something that Jesus is foreign of. Because we have to realize that transition is a part of life. Change is a part of life. What happens, happens. And one of the things that I've began to realize is, is, is that a lot of times within our faith talk, and you my heart when I say this, a lot of times we dismiss the pain because we want to find the purpose. Sometimes we dismiss the disappointment because we're looking for God's appointment. But I tell you, there's no appointment without disappointment. There's, there's no purpose without the pain. And so the key here is for us to begin to realize that within everything, th- there's a part. You see, th- there's no birth without the pain. Am I speaking to somebody? There's, there's no, I like to say it like this, there's no purpose found without the realization of, of the journey or the preparation taken. And so one of the things I never want to happen or let happen within our lives is, is that we dismiss any part of the process, that we dismiss any feeling or we dismiss anything because we, we want to inject Christian Botox because it's got to look good, it's got to feel good, and we've, we've got to have it all together all the time. No, we don't. And so these fears, these disappointments, these apprehensions, these anxieties are all part of the process. But it would be futile of me to continue to allow us to look to the greater things without realizing greater things happen in greater people. And God uses these situations and circumstances not to bring us to a place of pain, though there's pain. It brings us to a greater place of purpose. Am I speaking to somebody? And so if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John. And chapter 14, and and this is where it comes out of, and this is where we'll be sort of launching from today. And this is is what we've got to look at. John 14, we realize, I, I love the book of John. John chapter 13, let's give some context here. Jesus has sat down with his disciples, John chapter 13. And he's at the table with his disciples. Now, the table is a place of relationship. And he's sitting at the table, and he's like, listen, guys, there's going to be some amazing things happen. I'm going to wash your feet. So he washes their feet. And yet again in that act, the response isn't a one of humility. The response in that is one of pride. 
Jesus is saying, I want to do this for you. And Peter's like, you can't do that. And you know, it's amazing within our lives when, when Jesus requires of us certain things, when, when Jesus invites us into certain journeys, it's amazing how our preconceived ideas or our, our preconceptions of things actually hinder the full purpose of what God is wanting to demonstrate in that moment. And so when, when Jesus says, hey, I'm going to wash your feet, all of a sudden there's, Peter's like, you can't do that. And Peter's, Jesus is like, no, listen, you, you're not understanding something. Now, was Peter wrong to respond the way he did? No, he wasn't. But it's amazing our humanity sometimes gets in the way or sometimes presents itself before our heart. I want to tell you something that, and I've said this before, our hearts know things our minds can't comprehend. How many of us have heard this statement, it doesn't make sense, but it feels right? I don't know, I, I, I don't know, it's, it just, I don't, I don't know what the heck's going on, but it just, it just feels right. I'm, I'm going to go with it. And it's sort of like this heart response, even though this doesn't, can't calculate or, or make sense of what is happening, our heart really lines up to this place of like, that makes sense. And so it's been the same in this sort of journey of, of nothing within me here. It makes sense of what, what God is orchestrating. And there's times when I, I've shifted from here back to here, and I'm like, no, no, let's, put a, let's just put a stop in this because this doesn't make sense. And still I have to come back to my heart and come back to that place of I've heard the still small voice, God has spoken. And you come back to the Word, you come back to, to the words. And this is what I love about Jesus and His disciples. And so if you find in, in John 13, this is where He begins to pepper Let's use the word pepper or season into the lives of the disciples what's actually going to take place. And so this is what he does. He washes their feet. Then he goes on and says this. Guess what? Someone amongst you, someone amongst us right now is going to betray me. And they're all at the table and John is leaning in on the breast. And as it says, you know, the one whom loved, who actually wrote the book. It's like the one whom Jesus loved the most is, is leaning in. And, and all of a sudden, Jesus is like, someone's going to betray me. And actually, I'm going to identify him right now because the one whom I give the bread to first, he's the one that's going to betray me. And Peter turns to John and says, John, ask him who it, who it is. Now, Peter didn't turn around and say, okay, Jesus, who is it? It's, Pete, John who, uh, it's Peter who asked John, ask Jesus who it is. Now, I'd love to be in that dynamic. It's like me sitting down next to Ray and going, hey, Ray, can you ask Di, does she want a cup of tea? Like, what the heck? I'm right there. Now, what was it about John? What was it about Peter asking John to ask Jesus? Come on. What, what was that about? Do you know what I think it was about? I think Peter actually felt like he had offended Jesus. Therefore, he didn't feel like he was connected with him. What if you turn around now and, and, and all of a sudden, Di says to me, hey, Gary, you know, I'd, I'd love to, if she, do, you know, if she can do this, I'd love to give you uh, a facial. Because that's what she does. And I'm like, no, Di, you do not give me a facial. There's no way I'm having a facial. And she's like, no, no, I feel I must do this. And you're like, no, flipping way, you're giving me a facial. And all of a sudden, through my, through my rejection, all of a sudden that rejection has caused Maybe a, a divide. And this is what happens. This is, this is what can happen within us. And this is what I believe happened to Peter. That's why he asked John, because Peter was pretty robust in his response to Jesus. No, you're not doing this. There's no way you're going to do that. And so I believe, and, and this is what we've got to understand about the disciples. We all think that Jesus and his disciples was perfect community. Do, who thinks that? Who has thought that? We think Jesus and his disciples are perfect community. Oh, I want to model my community of Jesus and his disciples. Good Lord, you had someone who turned around and denied him, betrayed him, doubted him. 
And all these responses are all valid. And Jesus isn't afraid of them. Jesus didn't remove himself from the relationship. Peter removed himself. And Peter's sort of response, Peter's posture is now like, oh, I, I don't feel like I can ask Jesus because there's been this. So what does Peter do? Peter now asks John. <laughs> You ask him. Am I, can we see that out of Scripture? Yeah? And this is what I love within in community. Community isn't perfect. Community. And this is what we have to realize. Not everything goes according to our plans. Not everything goes according to, to what we, we think that we've signed up for, what we think we're a part of. Because guess what? Shift happens. Yeah, But we have to realize that none of our feelings, none of our responses are ungodly. None of our responses are in a place of, of God being scared of them. Because this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus identifies his betrayer. Goes on. And this is what I love. Jesus identifies his betrayer and the disciples are like, oh, because this is what he says to Judas. He passes him the bread and says, whatever you must do, do quickly. And the Bible tells us that the disciples thought because he held the purse that he needed to buy some goods or, or give something to the poor. Do you know, I'm like, Jesus plainly just said, whoever I give this bread to is going to betray me. But yet, this, they, they were in a place of Oh, he must, he must have to buy some bread for people. Or he must go, have to go and give it to the poor. Can I tell you why they believed that? I don't think the disciples were stupid. I don't think the disciples were not all there. But Jesus paints the picture of why you see this response in verse 29. For some thought, because Jesus, G Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or, or go and give something to the poor. What you must do, do quickly. Jesus goes on and gives them this commandment. This is what he says, the new commandment I give you, that you love one another. You know, I don't believe that this is something Jesus was telling them to say, hey, you're not doing this. But this is what you must do. I believe verse 29 already exemplified they were already in love. They had a love for one another. Why? Corinthians 13. L love what? Believes all things, believes the best. So even when Jesus identified the betrayer, even when Jesus plainly, I don't know about you, but if I was sitting there and Jesus said, hey, I'm going to hand this piece of bread, watch closely. Hands the piece of bread to Judas and says, whatever you must do, do quickly. And the disciples turned around and said, oh, you must have to go and buy something. Or maybe he has to get some goods from the feast at Aldi. Who knows? Why? Because they believed the best. And this is a mark of a disciple. This is a mark of one who follows. This is a mark of one who, who is in love. Why? Because they believed the best. Even when Jesus, Son of God, identified his betrayer, even then they believed the best. Isn't that amazing? That just blows me away. But yet still Peter possibly postured himself in a way of, I don't know if I can talk to Jesus. I think I've offended him. Do you know, this is what amazes me. John 13 exemplifies community for me and what it looks like to actually do life. Yeah? And so then Jesus goes on and says, hey, I want to give you a new commandment. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. Then he goes on and suckers them with something else. Guess what? Not only is someone going to betray me, guess what, Peter? You're going to deny me. Je I tell you, I think Jesus is in prophetic presbytery or something because he is releasing words of discouragement. It's like, yeah, we'll have this feast together and guess what, Judas, you're going to betray me and it's okay, Peter. You're going to deny me. 
wow. Imagine inviting someone, inviting friends over for dinner, and all of a sudden you're sitting there you're like, oh, guys, thanks for coming. Actually, the one I give my first wine glass of wine to, you're actually going to betray me. Bless you. So good to have you here. Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. How are you doing, Peter? Oh, great. Oh, just shut up, Peter, because actually you're going to deny me. Because this is what he says. Because Peter is like, all of a sudden he's, he's come back now into this relationship, and he's like, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And he says, where I'm going, you can't follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. The word follow there comes from the word, literally means same road. It's, it's the word for disciple. It means you're on the same track. Where I'm going, you can't follow, but you will. And this is what I love. And then Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. Peter gets dramatic. How many people have you noticed when drama's happening, drama, dr- drama happens? Maybe let me try this side. How many people have noticed when drama happens, people get dramatic? You know, I'm like, come on. And all of a sudden, Peter's like, I'm going to lay my life down for you. Jesus, I'm going to lay my life down for you. And then Jesus responds like this. Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall crow till you have denied me three times. (laughs) I'm going to lay my life down. Yeah, yeah, you're going to deny me. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes on, and, and we, we jump now into one of the most famous chapters in John, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You know, I love this. Jesus now has just identified his betrayer, told someone he's going to betray him, and then all of a sudden turns around. Oh, sorry, deny him. And then all of a sudden turns around. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You see, Jesus is painting a picture of what's going to happen. There's transition coming. And Jesus is painting for them, this is what happens in transition. This is what happens. These are the, the possible outcomes in transition. You see, I'm not saying that people are going to, betray, but there's feelings of betrayal. Yeah? I'll be honest with you, there's people here right now and and maybe listening that when we announced what was happening, there was a feeling of betrayal. I feel betrayed. And friend, I want to I want to validate that this morning. That's that's not something that's foreign to God and it's not foreign in this process. Why? Because this is what was happening here. In this in this time that of transition there's a feeling of betrayal. Can I suggest to us this morning that even in this transition, there's also going to be denial? Oh, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong. You see, you, you go from one scale to the other. Denial happens. But this is what Jesus is inviting us into, is let not our hearts be troubled. Because this is what happens. The word trouble there literally means an inner turmoil. It's the same word as tribulation. But this is one thing I know, that even in the midst of transition, the one who walks on water and the one who stills the storm is with us. And this is what he's calling us to is these greater things. And in John 14, Jesus turns turns around and says, let not your heart be troubled. Goes through this whole place of what the Father has revealed, what God is doing, what Jesus is laying out. And this is what he says in verse 12. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater than these he will do because I go to my Father. All of a sudden he lands it again. Guess what, guys, I'm going. But guess what? Greater things. There's something that's going to happen. You see, at this point, this is where Jesus is laying aside. This is where Jesus is laying the mark, I believe, of revealing one of the greatest things that changed my life is that I believe in a Savior that is not greater than me, but has laid down His life so that I can do greater things. 
that I don't have to come up to his standard, that he came down to mine so that I can go up. You see, every religion in this world is all centered around the greatness of their deity or their God. I'll tell you, the reason I love Jesus is because it's not about the greatness of his deity. It's about the humility and the sacrifice in which he laid down his life. And even in his lowest, in my eyes, he's the greatest. Yeah? And so this is the beautiful thing, is now he turns around and says, now guys, I'm going to the Father, but greater things are you going to step into. But still, there's this, well, Jesus, these feelings are valid, because I'm, we're feeling, we're feeling it. And I want us to go on, if we can, to, to John chapter, and this is what I love. We're going to go to the end of John. John 20, John 20. So Jesus appears to his disciples in John 20, 19. It says, then the same day, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst. I love this. When every door was closed and they were in fear, <sighs> Jesus appears. Can you imagine that? You've locked every door. You know, it's, it amazes me that you can, you know, you can make things all secure. And you can make things all, we're going to make sure everything is, is, is secure. And all of a sudden, Jesus just walks through the wall. Or walks through the door. You know why Jesus could do that? Because he is the door. Jesus doesn't need the door. He is the door. And this is the beautiful thing I love. Is when he, when he walks in, he's, the first thing he says is peace. You see, there's two things that we need in our lives. One is love. And one is peace. Let me say that again. Two things two attributes, two virtues, two fruits of the Spirit that I believe are, are, need to be evident within our lives in every aspect is love and peace. Why? Love, Corinthians 13, love believes all things, sees the best, is not haughty, is not puffed up. I encourage you, read Corinthians 13, not only when you go to a wedding or when you want to get married or you, you found someone you want to love, but read Corinthians 13. I tell you, I, I try and read Corinthians 13 at least once a month. Because I want to be reminded of the environment that Jesus has invited me to dwell in. I want to be reminded of a new covenant or a new commandment. How many of us are living our lives according to ten commandments instead of Jesus is one? And in fulfilling that one commandment of Jesus, you fulfill the ten. Because when you're in love and love is in you, you fulfill every commandment. Am I speaking to somebody? And this is the beautiful thing. Jesus then comes in their midst. Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now, all of a sudden, it's not about Jesus going. It's now about the disciples being sent. And Jesus appears to them. But we have to realize, how many times did Jesus appear to his disciples after the resurrection? I'll give you a clue. Rhymes with tree. Three. Three days he was in the ground. Three day, times he, he appeared to them. The second time he appeared to them was when Thomas, they came to Thomas, and this is what I love. Uh, Thomas, Jesus appeared to us. Don't be stupid. I'm not going to believe that until I can actually put my hand and my fingers through the hole and my hand in his side. What happens? <laughs> Jesus turns up. I love it in the midst of doubt, destiny shows up. In the midst of feeling like, I'm not going to believe that. You see, this is what happens in our life, even in our doubt. You see, this is, this is what I want to encourage you right now. Doubt is not unbelief. I don't think you got that. Let me say that again. Doubt is not unbelief. Unbelief will short-circuit any encounter with God, but doubt will never. You see, the opposite of faith isn't doubt. Do you know that? 
The opposite of faith is surety. And so when you've got surety, you don't need faith. But doubt is a, is a natural response. This is what I love. We have all these emotions going on, and this is what we look over. We think, you know, they, they, there's, there's no emotion here. And guys, trust me, as, as a very low responder, I'm amazed I'm even seeing this in Scripture. But we see all these responses all throughout Scripture. We see doubt. We see betrayal. We see denial. All these different things we see. Because why? In the times of transition, this is what happens within our heart because we are yet to have an anchor. And this is the hope. This is what Peter talks about. We have an anchor in our souls. And God is, is, is looking for this anchor. And guys, trust me, just because we're anchored doesn't mean the ship doesn't move. Yeah? Just because we trust doesn't mean we ha don't have doubts. Just because we have faith doesn't mean there's times we have surety. Just because we, we believe and trust and love doesn't mean sometimes we don't get angry. This is what we've got to validate within the Christian walk. This is what we've got to come to is that God is wanting us to be a people that, that realize that everything is real. You see, the, the word of faith doesn't mean that I deny the situation. It means I invite the impossible. It doesn't mean that, you know, I've, I, you know you, you've probably heard this before when someone's leg is hanging off and they're like, no, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Well, your leg's hanging off, buddy. No, no, I'm healed. You see, this is what we have to realize is, is word of faith doesn't mean blab it and grab it. It, it means to realize that even though the circumstances present themselves as this, I am believing the greater things will happen. But guess what? My now is part of my future. My now is part of my testimony. You see, you, you can't have a testimony of, of the miraculous unless the, the part of the testimony is you needed a miracle. And this is what we have. We deny the need of a miracle because we're believing for the miracle. Am I speaking to somebody? And so I want to encourage you. And this is what I loved about Jesus is, is that he always spoke to the greater things. Greater things, greater things. And so we go on. The third time he appears to Jesus. I, I, want, to, I want to show you something here. The absolute humanity of the disciples. You see, this is what was happening. Jesus was with them for three and a half years, yeah? Then he dies. I love how threes, these threes. He dies. He's gone three days. All of a sudden, he appears again. He appears to them in a locked room. Then he disappears. Now, what would happen to you if someone came to you, maybe for an hour, and then disappeared again? Are you going to be back in that place of trepidation, in that place of feeling betrayed? Yeah? Good Lord, you, you know, you, you, you just showed up and now you disappeared again. We go back to that place. And this is where I see the disciples respond because this is one of my favorite verses in recognizing that God isn't afraid of our humanity. And we find it in the, in the chapter, John 21, and it's verse 3. Well, let's read from verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. You've just, like you've just worked wonders, you went out, you were sent out with a empty, you've just received the Holy Spirit, Jesus has breathed on them, <laughs> received the Holy Spirit, I'm commissioning you guys, you're now set apart, and then Jesus dis disappears. Jesus reappears, but they don't know it's him, and Peter turns around to the guys and says, I'm going fishing. I'm done. I'm going fishing. You see, in the time of transition, in the time of the unknown, in the time 
where, where these things manifest, this is what happens. We always default to what we know. We always default to the natural and not the supernatural. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. They went out. They, they worked wonders. They, they saw blind eyes open. They saw all these miracles. They saw phenomenal things happen while Jesus was pumping with them. Oh, my gosh, Jesus is present. Jesus is awesome. We're going to do this stuff because he's made us fishers of men. And all of a sudden, Jesus disappears, and they revert back. I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. I'm done. Peter's done. <laughs> Dude, I'm going fishing. I'm done with this ministry crap. I'm going fishing. I'm done with this call on my life. I'm, I'm done with this. Why? Because Jesus was trying to show them something that he was, he was breathing and, and inviting them into maturity. Is Guys, guess what? You've done it with me. I've shown you how to do it. This is what, this is what the phrase was. And this is why I believe it was three and a half years he was with the disciples. Half of that year was getting to know them. The first year, he was showing them the stuff. The last part, he was then doing it together with them. And then the next phase is he was wanting them to do it by themselves. This is discipleship. This is father. And this is what my dad did with me. He showed me how to do it. We did it together. And then he said, son, do it. I'm going to make a cup of tea. Do it. And I'd be there like, ah! I can't do it. I'm looking for my dad. Dad, what, what if I mess up? I remember when he first taught me how to weld. The first and the last time I ever held something like that because it scared the hell out of me. But he showed my brother, and my brother became one of the best welders in the steelworks at 17 years of age. 17 years of age, one of the best welders. And, and they, they employed him, but when they found out his age and that he didn't actually have a qualification, they were like, What? Why? Because my, my brother stepped into discipleship. I couldn't. I couldn't do it if my father wasn't present. And this is the beautiful thing of what Jesus was wanting to do, was to show them he was bringing them into maturity. And so when Peter turns around and says, Ah, oh, I'm going fishing. I'm done with this. Dude, you've seen the eyes of the blind open. You've seen the dead raised. You've seen the works. You've seen it all. You spent three years, you've seen it all. You've seen some amazing things. But yet all of a sudden, Jesus is disappearing, and then you're going fishing. Can you imagine on his, on his house, going fishing? Friend, I want to ask you right now, how many of us are going fishing instead of remaining being fishers of men? How many of us are defaulting instead of going, and going after and continuing in our destiny. My heart for you right now is, is that whatever God is doing in this will bring us into greater things. But not just us collectively, not just this as the church, but you as an individual. God will bring you into greater things. Because there's something that, that has to be realized here that we have to move from this place of of, of doing it together where God wants to launch you. God wants to bring you into that place where you begin to stand and begin to realize, actually, Jesus has called me to greater things. And Jesus realized that the disciples could not step into greater things unless he left the picture. Am I speaking to somebody? And so as much as it pains, as much as it hurts, as much as it it's disappointing. And, and guys, hear my heart. This isn't just something that everyone bar me and Sarah are feeling. We, we are feeling it big time. Good Lord. You know, we, nine years of our life, we, we, don't, we don't just like this community. We love this community. We love what God has done, God is doing, and God is going to do. But guess what? Just like Jesus... He, we, we have positioned and realized that, that there's greater things that have to take place. There's greater things that God wants us to step into. And Jesus, you know, they go out fishing. I'm going fishing, said Simon Peter. And guess what? The others said, well, we're going with you as well. Because if you're going fishing, we're going fishing. All of a sudden, they've now defaulted. To not just a place of, of doing what they used to. They've gone right back to the start. Where did Jesus find them when he was following them? 
fishing. They don't go back to fishing. Friend, my prayer is, is that we don't default back to what we were. We don't default back. We, we don't go back. But the we progress, the we press on, the we press through and we press on. Am I speaking to somebody? They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. <laughs> what? You fishermen, you went out and you caught nothing? What? Why? Because one thing I realize, when, when God's grace has come off you for something, God's put his grace on you for another. The grace for fishing wasn't on them. Why? Because they weren't fishing out of a purpose. They were now fishing out of pain. They were now fishing out of, well, I'm stuffed this, I'm going fishing. They were trying to fill their life with something to do. Can you, can you believe that? Fishermen didn't catch a thing. I, I, what? And all of a sudden it says, And when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. I love this. Jesus appears so many times and they didn't know it was him. Why? Because default will always cause you to default and place people in your history and never in your future. Let me say that again. When you default, you will always remember people as they were, never as they are. You see, I, you know, when, when people tell, tell me, there's, you know, there's, I've got cousins in my life who are, are now 17 years of age. The last time I saw them was, they were probably about 9 or 10. You, you stick them people in your mind as 9 and 10, don't you not? Nieces and nephews are like, what? She's 17? Good Lord. I'm, I, she's only 9. You know, it's like seeing Katie. You know, I still remember little Katie. Not so little anymore. When we were down in Laser Drive, I walked into the little kitchen we had, and there she is drying pots and pans with Harry. And I still remember little Katie. And to look at, when I think of Katie, I don't think of Katie, I still think of Katie. And that's the thing within our humanity is we always lock people into the place and never the purpose. And this is what Jesus was realizing. I don't believe that Jesus morphed himself into, into different, you know, he was Hispanic and then he was maybe African American and, and then he was Chinese and then he was Japanese, how he appeared to people. I don't believe he did that. <laughs> I believe he, Jesus was resurrected as he is, but the blindness of what defaulting and what pain does is we lock people in the past instead of realizing we have a future. I might speak into somebody. And this is what Jesus turned around and says to them. Verse 5, look at this. Children, have you any food? What? Jesus is now calling them what? Why? Can I suggest to us today that their whole response has been childlike and Jesus is calling them to maturity? You see, dependability is that of a child. To feel abandoned is the feeling of a child. But to realize there is a greater purpose and this is where you have to realize, and this is what happens with children, and this is what we mature to, is as a kid, whenever I saw my dad leave, I would, I would go into hysterics. I would, you know, I'd hyperventilate. My dad's leaving. But I didn't realize my dad was actually going to work. But until I came to that mature place of realizing my dad was leaving for a purpose, all of a sudden that anxiety didn't surround me any longer. Why? Because I realized there was purpose in the leaving. Am I speaking to somebody? And Jesus calls them children. And they answered him and said, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Everyone say some. <laughs> this is what I love about God. You know, God sort of think, hey, guess what? You're going to do greater things. You see, greater things to God 
are absolutely awesome, outstanding, exceedingly abundantly above to us. The same way as when Jesus said, I guess what, cast on the other side and you'll find some. Now, some in our language is maybe two or three, but what did they find? They didn't have enough. They couldn't even contain what was on the, left, on the right side of the board to the point they had to call others to help. And Jesus, they went out and caught. And This is what I love. Verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved and said to Peter, Hey, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it beforehand. Let me tell you, when you default... You throw everything off. I must bring this up. You just throw everything. I'm going to use a Welsh phrase right now. Bugger this. I'm going to just chuck it all off. I'm going fishing. You see, a garment speaks of a purpose. A garment speaks of I'm doing something. I'm going somewhere. You see, a garment, you know, you, you, we, we dress for certain occasions, yeah? It speaks of purpose. Peter threw that purpose off. And when he knew it was the Lord, all of a sudden, purpose came back. Identity came back. How do you know a policeman is a policeman? By his... How do you know a fireman is a fireman? Uniform. It's what you wear. And this is what happens when we feel we're in these times. We throw off our identity. But when Peter knew it was the Lord, he put his identity back on. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish to me. So when they dragged it up, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and the fish. You know, this is what I love. Verse 9, go back to verse 9. This is what I love. Then as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Where did that fish come from? Where the heck did that fish come from? There's Jesus just sitting by the thing. They haven't gone out. They've gone all night. They haven't caught a thing. Jesus just said, hey, cast it on the other side. You'll find some. They come back on land and Jesus is like, hey, Master Chef mystery box. This is one I prepared earlier. Where the heck did you get that fish from? And this is what it speaks of. Let's go back to John chapter 6. What did Jesus do in John chapter 6? He multiplied the, there's always provision. Where did he get the provision from? He got them from a, where did he get the fish and loaves from? Come on, guys. From a small boy. From a child. Jesus was wanting to represent, not just in John chapter 6, but all the way in John chapter 21, that even in the midst of our times, God is always providing. That there's, there's provision. Even, guess what? You can go out, and you can kick the butt. You can do what you want. You can have a tantrum. You can feel whatever you feel, but guess what? I'm not just going to... I'm not just going to bless you. Guess what? I, I, you, can, you can go fishing. But guess what? If you want to do what you want to do without me, guess what? It'll never happen. But when I show up, when I'm with you, this is what I love about Jesus. And this is the invitation he's calling us into. Guys, whatever we're going through, don't leave Jesus out of it. In the midst of every emotion, in the midst of every pain, in the midst of every purpose and every pleasure, just don't leave Jesus out of the equation. Because God will give you purpose in every place. And this is what I love, is there's always purpose. There's always a place where God wants to point us to. I'm going to give you something right now. This, this blows my mind. How do I know the story hasn't finished? Because it goes on in, in the book of Acts. Jesus did all this for them, yet they're still in the upper room, still in fear. But this is what I love. If you look at the end of the four Gospels, the last word you find there in the four Gospels is the word amen. You don't find that word at the end of the Acts of the Apostles. Why? Because the Acts of the Apostles is still being written. 
Yeah. He hasn't finished. And he wants to invite us into this, this reality of greater things, this purpose of greater things, that, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. But guess what? There can't be light at the end of the tunnel if there was no tunnel. <laughs> Let me try this side. There can't be light at the end of the tunnel if there was no tunnel. Lord, I bind the tunnel in Jesus' name. We just come against this tunnel. We loose the blessing over the... Guys, there can't be light at the end of the tunnel if there's no tunnel. And this is the beautiful thing that he's inviting us into, is, is that there's the purpose, there's the greater things he's calling us to. And that we can, guys, go fishing. That's fine. But there's greater things he's got for us. There's greater purposes. There's plans that, that go beyond our imagination. Go beyond anything we can think or ask. Jesus provided breakfast for them. And then he goes on. And it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did. And if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the beautiful thing. If that's, if that's the, the, the works of Jesus, and he says greater, then if the books can't contain this world, I think if the books can't be contained in this world, I think what God has for us cannot be contained in this galaxy. Yeah? So friend, I want to encourage you today. There's greater things that he's having us step into. There's greater purposes he has us to step into. And I want to say to you today, there's preparation and there's purpose. And I'll tell you, a lot of times when we step into the fullness that he has for us, and when we arrive at that place, I'll tell you, when Peter stood up that day and says, Men of Galilee, let it be known to you this day that what you see, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but this is a fulfillment. He didn't just speak of a fulfillment of the prophetic word. He was the fulfillment of the prophetic word. And I want to tell you, there is a day that's not too far from now where you will be realizing, my gosh, this is the fulfillment of everything that went on. This is the purpose. This is the reason. And you know, that time is amazing. That time is like, wow. But it sucks beforehand. Let me tell you. A plane. What was a plane created to do? Fly? Have you ever seen a plane fly? Doesn't it look gracious? Doesn't it look, it's amazing. You know, for me, the, the, one of the greatest things I ever saw was an A380. Phenomenal. You know, just looping. I'm like, this thing is just, it's huge, but it's just like effortless. But the greatest exertion, the greatest, um, you know, output that that plane has to happen is not when it's flying, it's when what? When it has to take off. Why? Because it has to take off against the wind, not with it. And so the greatest, the greatest resistance, the greatest effort, the greatest things happen when, when it has to go down that runway, and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing, and how many people have been on the A380? Yeah, I'm like, this thing ain't taking off. This thing is going too slow. I'm telling you, this thing, and all of a sudden, whoa, look at that. Good, how the heck did this, it wasn't even going fast enough. And it's so funny that the bigger the plane, it seems the slower the takeoff. The smaller the plane, it's like, you know, it's like you go, you go in these little CRJ or these little Embera 90s, and it's like these things shake like crazy, and it's like, ah, and then it takes off. And you think you're going to die. You're like, good Lord, I'm going to die. And guys, you might be feeling right now, I'm going to die. That's it. I'm feeling for the, yeah, flotation device. <laughs> yeah, I might have to put a parachute on, but... I'm going to die, but that's the thing, is when, when a plane was not created to do anything else but to fly, but there's a preparation, there, there, is, a, there is a 
there is a path, there is a um, there is an event that takes place for it to get to that. You see, a rose, a plant, it was created to bloom. But there's a process that takes place for it to get to that. The greatest place is when, when you put that seed in the ground. The greatest, you know, you see nothing, you're like, I'm not seeing anything. Come on, call, it, call itself a plant, come on. And all of a sudden, you see the shoot come through. Do you know that amazes me? That, that ground is like packed down, and this thing gets through the ground, through the everything, and boom, it comes out. And you realize now its greatest purpose is revealed in its greatest pain or its greatest problem or its greatest resistance. When I worked for Toyota, the most frustrating thing was, was seeing the production of the car. You're like, good Lord, come on. All these parts that have to come together, all these things that are fitted. How long is this going to, you know, what is this all about? Then all of a sudden you see the finished product. You realize there always was a purpose. There always was, was a plan. There always was this, this beautiful um, unfolding that was taking place. But it was painful. Sarah spoke so beautifully last week about he's in the waiting. Believe me, when you've taxied in Sydney airports, oh, it winds me up. Why can't you just get straight on the thing and off? Sydney, you've got to go all the way down this flip. Nick knows what it's like. You've got to go, all, particularly if they take you off this particular runway, you've got to go all the way down. I'm like, what? It's just there. But if, when all of a sudden the winds change, they take you on this one thing and you're taxiing forever. And this is the thing, guys, there's times to go fishing, but realize there's a greater purpose. Am I speaking to somebody? Yeah? Why don't we all stand today? Wow. I pray that this word will, will lay something within your life. I, I encourage you to go and re-listen to this, because there's keys here. There's, there's truths here that, that are going to set you free. Amen? Because greater things are we stepping into. Greater things that God is, is doing that, that, that are beyond our comprehension. And I'll tell you something. No, I can't say that. That's a Welsh term. Uh, hindsight is, uh, is, is not helpful. Hindsight is not helpful sometimes. But then hindsight is very helpful. Because you look back and you realize, wow. God. But God. God, I can see it. God, I recognize it. God... And this is why I believe the Jewish nation is one of the most formidable, resistant um, nations on the planet. Is because, you know, how many times have, the, have the, you know, Israel or Jews tried to be killed? Come on, flip and stroll on. But yet God always turns around to them and says, hey, remember. But you know, they're not taught to just remember the good. They're taught to remember everything. Everything is part of the story. And this is what I love about the Hebraic mindset is that everything is part of the story. They don't chop and chop. Well, let's just leave that bit out because that doesn't sound good. No. It's, it's, what gives, it, it, it's what causes the good to shine brighter. You see, what causes a candle to be at its brightest? The darkest. The darkest it is, the brighter the candle. And this is the beautiful thing, Yeah. Someone's just got that revelation. And so why don't we put our hands on our hearts right now. And I want to pray this prayer purposefully, intently, with intention, not just out of a place of these are good words, Lord. But my prayer is that, Lord, you would set me up for greater things. That I posture my heart for greater things. And, Lord, even when I go fishing, I know there's greater things. Even, Lord, when I feel betrayed, there's greater things. Even, Lord, when I, I deny, there's greater things. Lord, even when I doubt, there's greater things. Lord, even when I feel fear, there's greater things. Lord, even when I, I don't know, there's greater things. Because you have a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. So, Lord, I posture myself for greater things. Lord, I, I place my heart in your hands. 
My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I'll tell you something, friend. When you place all things in God's hand, you see God's hand in all things. Let me say it again. When you place all things in God's hands, you see God's hands in all things. So, Lord, we do that right now. Those watching online, I encourage you. Put your hand on your heart right now and say this prayer. Father, I posture my heart. I open my heart for greater things, knowing that I can trust you, knowing that you never leave me nor forsake me. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give him some praise.